you all good evening and welcome to this special meeting of the Sierra Club Massachusetts chapter forest protection team. The Clean Energy and Climate Plan, or CECP, is the guiding document for many policy decisions as Massachusetts moves towards net zero and 30 by 30 goals. Tonight, we'll discuss some of the concerns with current CECP 2050, specifically related to the natural and working land section. This topic is particularly relevant for all of us who are working to promote the vision of preserving natural lands and forests in particular as a means to address both the climate and biodiversity crises. Before we get started, I'll go over a couple of housekeeping details. We're asking everyone except the speakers to stay muted unless you are called on to ask a question after the presentation. At that time, we'll open up the meeting for questions and Carol Horowitz will moderate the Q&A section. In order to include as many people as possible, we ask that you use the raise hand function in the reactions button and that you keep questions, including any explanation that goes along with the questions to one minute. We won't be monitoring the chat for questions, so make sure to raise your hand. Of course, you may save the chat at the end of the meeting. And also, if you want to just see the speaker, as I said, just click on the view button and the side by side. Finally, um, you probably have seen this meeting as being recorded, but you will not be recorded unless you speak and your camera is on. So um, now I would like to introduce you to our presenters, Bill Stubblefield and Bart Baricious. Bill Stubblefield has had a lifelong interest in ecology and evolution. He has an MA in biology from the University of California and a PhD in biology from Harvard University. Over the last few years, he has focused on potential of natural solutions to the plant multiple planetary crises we now face, especially the potential of forests to accumulate carbon and preserve biodiversity. Currently, Bill devotes most of his time to climate activism through involvement with multiple environmental groups, including the Sierra Club's Forest Protection Team, Wendell State Forest Alliance, and he is the founder of the Forest Facts Group that analyzes data and reports that drive political policy, public policy around forest management from economic, political, social, and ecological perspectives. Bart Baricius has studied forests for over 50 years, ranging from above the Arctic Circle to the tropics. He earned master's degrees from both the University of Stockholm in Sweden and SUNY at Buffalo in Environmental Studies. Bart has published papers in peer-reviewed journals, has lectured, lectured on tropical forests and climate change, and worked extensively in measuring tree volume and carbon sequestration and storage. So let's go ahead and get started and welcome to Bill and Bart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn, for that generous introduction. And thanks to everyone watching. We very much appreciate your precious time. As you know, the Global Warming Solutions Act passed in 2008 committed Massachusetts to reaching net zero carbon emissions by the year 2050. The Clean Energy and Climate Plans, or CECPs for short, lay out the state government's roadmap for how to get there. Beginning with the passage of the Next Generation Climate Bill, <clears throat> now known as Chapter 8 of the Acts of 2021, the state is now required to fully incorporate natural and working lands into these plans. This evening, we will explore how this mandate is reflected in the CECPs released in 2022 during the last months of the Baker administration. <clears throat> Let's begin by reviewing what chapter eight, wait, missed a page here. We will focus on the two documents from 2022 shown here. The first released at the end of June laid out plans for the years 2025 and 2030, and the second released on December 21st provided an overall plan for reaching net zero by 2050. 
net zero means that any remaining emissions at that time must be balanced by an equal quantity of greenhouse gases removed from the atmosphere, either by the growth of natural ecosystems, especially forests, or by technological means. Our central concern will be the role of natural and working land in these plans. <clears throat> we will be arguing that the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan are one, overly pessimistic about carbon accumulation on natural and working lands and overly optimistic about new technology from the so-called innovation ecosystem and that two, they often obscure rather than clarify the importance of natural and working land for reaching net zero. And three, they embrace an overall vision of ongoing growth and business as usual with an emphasis on market-based solutions of highly questionable effectiveness. And finally, four, they emphasize climate risks for carbon sequestration on natural and working lands while ignoring even greater risks from relying on carbon dioxide removal technology. <clears throat> Next. Speaker notes, go ahead. The bottom line is that a great deal of work is still needed. Oh, okay. Uh, Sorry. Go ahead. Shall I move on? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Let's begin by reviewing what Chapter 8 has to say about natural and working lands, as defined in this section. Basically, natural and working lands include all lands that are not highly developed settlement lands, including farms, orchards, and ranches, forests of all sorts, whether managed for wood products or not, wetlands of all descriptions, both inland and coastal, as well as lands devoted to outdoor recreation. Given the climate emergency we now face, this is of enormous importance because it is living ecosystems that provide the only means now available to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at anywhere near the scale required. This section of chapter eight establishes a clear statutory mandate to set numerical benchmarks and track the release of greenhouse gases from and carbon sequestration by natural and working lands. As we shall see, however, we are still long ways from satisfying this mandate. This section requires that the Commonwealth measure and monitor carbon flows to and from work, natural and working lands as a core component of our climate plans. They must also adopt statewide goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase carbon sequestration on natural and working land and develop plans for how to achieve those goals. <clears throat> A further requirement of chapter eight is that all source data and assumptions must be publicly disclosed and made available for public examination and use to the maximum extent permitted by law. This section establishes a clear mandate that it is not sufficient to merely report conclusions. The states must also share the data and thinking that went into reaching those decisions. Unfortunately, as matters now stand, citizens have only very limited means for holding the Commonwealth accountable for such analytical transparency. This figure displays the recognized subdivisions of natural and working lands in Massachusetts. This is essentially the same classification used by the federal government. 
note that no distinction is made between public and private forest lands, nor between forests and reserves and those managed for wood products. This is a serious problem because any carbon gains from land protected from logging are assumed to balance any carbon losses from logging. Moreover, our public lands, the lands we hold in common, should be maintained to best serve the public welfare. And there should be a democratic process to determine how to do so. This figure for the year 2019 shows the emissions from the different land use categories with bars extending to the right from the zero line being emissions into the atmosphere and those extending to the left being negative emissions or carbon sequestration. Settlement and farm store soils are net sources of carbon emitted into the atmosphere, while biological growth in wetlands, forests, and settlement trees are net carbon sinks uh, absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. Se settlement biomass, uh, shown in the orange bar, um, mostly trees in urban and suburban areas provide significant carbon sequestration. <clears throat> um, but most se sequestration comes from the forest land category represented by the three green bars. Each bar represents a component of carbon sequestration in forests. In order of increasing size, we have harvested wood products, new forest land, which is mostly former farmland allowed to return to forest, and forest land remaining forest land. Um, Note that the harvested wood products are shown as a substantial carbon sink, but this needs some careful unpacking to fully understand what's actually shown here. These are the reported figures for the three forest land components in the previous figure, each given as a carbon stock change. Regarding forest land remaining forest land, this chart shows that the amount of carbon in forest lands at the end of the year was 4.57 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, greater than at the beginning of the year. It is shown as a negative number because that amount was removed from the atmosphere by the growing forest. This is by far the biggest component of carbon removal in Massachusetts. However, what is reported as harvested wood products carbon stock change is actually quite a different animal altogether. What this number represents is the total amount added to the carbon pool in harvested wood products while ignoring all subtractions from that pool because of burning or decay, whether that happens in Massachusetts or somewhere else. These removals from the product pool are supposed to be accounted for elsewhere. <clears throat> yes. The analysis in line with a so-called production approach. Yeah, in, I see what happened. In, employed by the federal government. Approach adopted by the federal government. Sorry yeah. about that. Okay, it happens. <laughs> uh, at the very least, annual forest growth must exceed annual harvest to have any plausible claim as sustainable forestry. According to the Massachusetts Forest Action Plan from 2020, logging in the state removed about 14.7% as a net annual growth increment in 2017. Assuming this held for 2020, 14.7% of the 4.57 million metric tons of reported for forest growth, or 0 0.67 metric, mil, million metric tons would have been harvested. And this is extremely close 
to the 0 0.66 million metric tons reported as the CO2 equivalent added to the harvested wood products pool. In other words, essentially all the carbon removed by logging is counted as a contribution to carbon sequestration. From this point of view, logging has no environmental impact at all. This, is of, this of course, is a result of applying the production approach to carbon accounting, where the carbon emissions from logging supposedly show up somewhere else. In any event, the separation of the negative and positive emissions from logging yields a highly misleading picture of carbon flow to and from forest land that is grossly inadequate as a basis for developing forest policy. In fact, the emissions associated with the harvest, processing, and transport of wood products greatly reduce the net sequestration in wood products. <clears throat> <clears throat> this problem is clearly revealed in this figure from the plan for 2025 and 2030, which completely misrepresents the contribution of harvested wood product shown in brown at the top of the figure. Note that harvested wood products pool is shown as growing steadily every year from 1990 to 2020 increasing overall by more than 265%. But this is entirely erroneous because it completely ignores the annual losses from the product pool because of fire and decay. These lost emissions may show up somewhere else, but they cannot be ignored when developing forest policy. Excuse me. This figure from the plan for 2050 provides a sector by sector summary of emissions from 1990 to 2050, giving the history of emissions from 1990 to 2020 and an illustrative potential emissions trajectory from 2020 to 2050. The teal region at the bottom below the zero line represents the estimated negative emissions or carbon sequestration by natural and working land. <clears throat> Zooming in and stretching the y-axis to get a better view, we find that there are no emission limits, sublimits, or goals after 2030. In fact, instead of increasing sequestration on natural and working land, an overall decline is projected, the darker shade of teal, and a growing reliance on sequestration by out-of-state forest land or carbon dioxide removal technology, the paler wedge at the lower right. Indeed, well over half of the needed sequestration is projected to come from hoped for purchases from a projected carbon sequestration market that doesn't yet exist, but is imagined to emerge after 2030. We need to look more closely at just what this imaginary sequestration is supposed to be or where it's to come from but let's first take a closer look at the projected decline in natural sequestration. <clears throat> this passage from the 2050 plan states that natural sequestration is expected to decline in Massachusetts because our forests are getting old, 60 to 100 years old and at, the, at a stage when carbon accumulation tends to start slowing down because of competition, senescence, and limited regeneration. What is being described here is what ecologists call logistic growth, where a population grows rapidly from a small size, but then more slowly as environmental limits take hold 
and the car carrying capacity of the environment is approached. Unlike exponential growth shown on the left, where growth becomes faster and faster over time, logistic growth, as shown on the right, is, div is divided into two phases separated by an inflection point, growing faster and faster below that point and more and more slowly up thereafter. Other things being equal, under logistic growth, harvest removals can be maximized by harvesting down to some intermediate population size when the growth rate is maximal. But is this how forests grow? This figure shows how forests grow under various logging regimes, according to a model of forest growth developed by the United States Forest Service based on actual data from Northeastern forests. The colored lines show how above ground carbon changes over time in both the forest itself and in harvested wood products. The top line in red shows how above ground carbon increases over a span of 160 years, given no significant natural disturbance and no logging at all. Note that unlike logistic growth, there was no inflection point separating an early phase of accelerating growth from a later phase of slowing growth. Instead, the forest continues to add carbon throughout, but at a gradually slower rate. There is little evidence available to suggest that forest growth exhibits a logistic pattern, and the evidence usually offered comes not from natural forests, but from monocultural plantations, where all trees start out at the same size at the same time. The various lines below the red one show how carbon stocks change over time under different logging regimes from clear cut, where all trees are removed, to various patterns where only selected patches or individual trees are harvested. The obvious point is that all logging regimes reduce carbon stocks much below the level provided by the no management option, even when the carbon in wood products is taken into account. Clearly, the way to increase carbon accumulation in forests is to reduce logging by setting aside a significant area's reserves where no logging is allowed but reserves play no role at all in the climate plan for 2050. The plans for 2025 and 2030 did establish some quantitative goals for those years as shown here. In particular, the Commonwealth committed to increasing net sequestration on natural and working lands from roughly, roughly seven to 7.4 million metric tons per year by 2030. When we get to the plan for 2050, there are no goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase carbon sequestration on natural and working lands as required by chapter eight. Instead, we get a plan to increase permanently conserved land from 27% to 40% and to plant more trees near water and in cities, which is important, but contributes little to reaching the net zero goal for 2050. Most of you are probably surprised to learn that so much of our land has been and will be permanently conserved. But what this refers to is land where development is precluded but other exploitation is not. In particular, most of it is conserved for farming or logging and overwhelmingly the latter. What we have here is a policy to preserve the forest industry and not forests themselves at the expense of reduced prospects for reaching net zero. This is entirely to be expected when you invite prologging interests to develop your land use policies. 
closing the sequestration gap. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 85% as required by law leaves residual emissions of some 14.2 million metric tons of car carbon dioxide equivalent <clears throat> in the year 2050. And that must be balanced by carbon sequestration. According to the CECP 2050, significantly less than half this amount is projected to come from natural and working land. This projection, however, includes business as usual logging and reduced but ongoing forest conversion. A counterfactual simulation in the land sector report for 2020, assuming no logging nor forest conversion estimated the forest carbon stocks could potentially increase by between 36.3 and 42.5 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2050. This would go a long way to, toward closing the gap, if not eliminating it. Of course, this isn't going to happen, and carbon sequestration on thousands of acres have already been sold as offsets to ongoing carbon pollution. In any event, the plan for 2050 doesn't even try to balance emissions within the state. Instead, the Commonwealth is betting our future on being able to purchase sequestration credits based on out-of-state natural sequestration or engineered carbon dioxide removal, both of which are problematic. We will now turn to Bart to tell us more about how the Commonwealth is proposing to obtain the additional sequestration credit needed to meet the net zero goal. Thank you, Bill. I'm much appreciated. And I want to just say Bill did a lion's share of the work. All kinds of things were going on with my wife in the hospital for a while. She's fine now and lots of other stuff any rate, um, so I want to start with this table, which, as you can see across the, the top, has forestry-based methods, soil carbon sequestration, wetland restoration, etc. here. And uh, the table summarizes some of the potential sequestration approaches. Reading, a, um, uh, let's see, um, the last four of these things after wetlands are technology-based approaches in various states of readiness to get on with the job. The two that have received the most attention are BECS or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage where biomass is burned and the emissions are captured and stored underground and DACs where carbon dioxide is removed directly from the atmosphere. The blue arrows on the left are to remind me of a couple of points I want to make. The first is that the table claims that BEX is a mature technology, which is very far from the truth. And the other is that nature-based approaches do share high H uh, uh, MRV difficulty, that is uh, problems with measurement reporting and verification. And existing measurements are often highly misleading, as I will get to in a moment. You missed a slide. Uh, did I? Oh, I did. Did I miss a slide? I'm going back to where I was. Ah, yes, yes I did. Okay. Um, sometimes it jumps an extra slide. It's probably my tremor. Um, here's the second page of the same table and a couple of further points I'd like to make. Uh, of the different approaches, only forest-based sequestration is has high regional potential. And more importantly, it is simply wrong to suggest that forests have only low to medium permanence, as amply revealed by the fossil record. Forests can last many thousands of years, even in the face of dramatic increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. 
As shown in this uh, graphic from a newly released report on engineered carbon dioxide removal, more than 99.9% .9 of terrestrial carbon sequestration now occurs in natural ecosystems. And to think that an embryonic industry facing major engineering and economic challenges will achieve sufficient scale to be affordable and readily available in the marketplace soon enough to meet the projected need by 2050 is to live in a fool's paradise yearning for a visit from the techno fairy. I just want to point out here that all, all of this Bex, biochar, and other, and other uh, new technologies, of course, biochar is basically you know, nothing, nothing but burned wood. There's nothing special about it, contrary to what people may have heard. Um, here is it, and there have been many peer review science studies of it. Um, here is, it's just a tiny thin line is, is all that that amounts to. Um, this, the CECP 2050 plan includes this diagram of the innovative uh, ecosystem, em emphasizing uh, technocentric visions of that that underline the entire plan. It is the economic ecosystem that is supposed to research, develop, finance, and deploy the technology needed to achieve decarbonization. The message is clear. Corporate interests can profit from decarbonization and thus help Massachusetts prosper under the new order. This, of course, raises serious questions about uh, what ensures that corporate interests are aligned with public interests. Incidentally, you may notice the fossil uh, carbon giants, Shell Oil and BASF, next to the corporate partners petal on the central flower. A critical mission for the state and its partners is to develop and implement protocols, by the way, BAS, BASF is a major pesticide manufacturer, uh, important protocols for purchasing sequestration services beyond what our natural and working lands can provide. This process is already underway, mostly behind closed doors. Next, we turn to the market-based schemes for trading carbon offset credits that are a critical part of the plan for 2050. So here we see in a forest environment, uh, carbon credits can be certified because uh, more carbon is uh, being sequestered than is being emitted from the forest and that, it, that there's additional carbon entering the forest environment. Um, then the carbon credits are sold to usually a fossil fuel company which allows it to continue emitting uh, carbon dioxide and other pollutants to the atmosphere. And the organization or company that owns the forested land gets cash uh, from, the, from the fossil fuel industry. Um, Forest-based carbon credits are the overwhelming majority of credits at this time. This diagram, uh, is from a offset broker. It shows a simplistic picture of what's supposed to happen. We must assume that additional carbon is added to the forest. This is referred to as additionality and is critical for the validity of carbon offset credits. A carbon credit certifier who is often collaborating with a broker will certify that carbon in some forested land has um, would have been lost to logging were it not agreed instead to protect and certify the land for carbon credits. Credits are then awarded on the basis of um, basis on that basis and sold in turn to some other company to allow that company to continue emitting carbon now in theory at least offset by an equal amount of additional carbon in the certified forest land. Thus the purchasing company can claim to be moving forward in its effort to reach carbon neutrality. Um, globally, the world's forests sequester about 30% of human-caused carbon emissions each year. 
this is an amazingly valuable service provided to humanity. And carbon offset credits are an attempt to monetize that value. Existing carbon credit markets, however, have been shown to be deeply flawed. Critical investigations of the, FOSS, of the offset market have been published in many, many peer-reviewed science journals and such mainstream sources as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Overall, they have shown that offset markets have actually been making climate change worse, increasing, not reducing overall carbon emissions. Articles touting carbon markets can usually be traced back to financially interested parties. Carbon credit markets appear to have developed largely as a result of an ideological preference for market solutions and because of the continual search for new markets by the financial sector. Based on this extensive research, however, forest ecologist Charles Canham from the Cary Institute for Ecosystem Studies concluded that, quote, the bottom line is clear, a great deal of money will change hands, landowners with large tracts of forest land will be enriched, companies will claim grossly exaggerated quantities of carbon offsets, and brokers will collect large fees. Canham noted further that the purchase of offset credits will allow continued emissions of not just um, carbon, but other pollutants with disproportionate impacts on disadvantaged communities. The overall result is that companies that buy these credits will emit large amounts of additional carbon into the atmosphere. Um, the figure on the left shows that the 94.9 million carbon credits claimed by the world's biggest certify of the, the of of the 94.9 million claimed by the world's biggest certifier which is vera is the company by the way only 5.5 million show any real emissions reductions this comes from a major investigative piece in the guardian with the headline revealed more than 90 percent of rainforest carbon offsets by the biggest certifier in the world are worthless analysis shows a companion article published by the at the same uh, time quoted kevin anderson a professor of energy and climate change at the university of manchester as saying my take on offsets even supposedly good ones is that from a climate perspective they are worse than doing nothing at all also, a news flash. Just last Tuesday, a new article in The Guardian announced CEO of biggest carbon credit certifier to resign after claims offset worth, uh, uh, offsets after claims offsets worthless. And this has also appeared in several other papers that he has saying that he has uh, resigned as a result of the analysis showing that the, the carbon credits are worthless. And um, so his pushback has not been very successful. But closer to home, in 2021, there was a story reported from ProPublica and the MIT Technology Review. It indicates that Mass Audubon earned millions by registering roughly 10,000 acres in a carbon offset credit program. According to this article, Mass Audubon's quote, planning documents acknowledge that the forests en enrolled in the program were protected long before they began generating offsets. Mass Audubon gained carbon offset credits for not logging these lands or at least not clear cutting them. The credits were then sold to companies in order to offset their ongoing carbon emissions. Surely if carbon cre uh, credits were sold out of state, to permit carbon pollution elsewhere, they shouldn't also be counted as helping Massachusetts reach its net zero goal. Nor is Mass Audubon alone. Forest, again, forest ecologist Charles Canham, who served for more than a decade on a regional nature conservancy advisory board, has done extensive research search revealing that the Nature Conservancy has also been involved in selling carbon offset credits on land that is already protected and thereby encouraging uh, um, 
encouraging increased carbon emissions and further damage to the climate. Canham has noted that, quote, our forests can and will continue to provide critically important carbon offsets to carbon emissions, but marketing those offsets to allow emitters to continue to pollute may be simply unethical. Now, I want to add that as a member myself of Mass Audubon, I think they are doing some good work on appropriate solar siting. Uh, here, Lucas Agriculture Solutions is promoting what they call carbon farming, thereby whereby carbon credits can be earned by using techniques that supposedly increase carbon in the ground. Uh, even Bayer, the global pesticide giant that recently bought Monsanto, is now acting as a carbon credit broker. Berkshire Hathaway's Business Wire quotes a Bayer official as saying, through working with groups like Nori, which is another company, we're able to enhance the offering within our foreground program, uh, platform to potentially enable even more growers to benefit from their environmentally sustainable farming practices. Uh, and Nori says in the same article, um, that its strategic investors include Toyota Ventures, Cargill, and the Nature Conservancy. Carbon credit markets are also attracting fossil carbon giants such as British Petroleum that recently bought a controlling share in the largest forest carbon offset developer in the US, Finite Carbon, which incidentally was the carbon offset uh, project developer for Mass Audubon. A few policy suggestions uh, do emerge. I'm going to turn this back over to Bill. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, our review of the Clean Energy and Climate Plans do suggest a few policy options that could help us take better advantage of our natural and working lands. Uh, including one, establish fully and permanently protected reserves, especially on public lands. Two, revise chapter 61 tax incentives to favor landowners wishing to protect their forests rather than subject them to further degradation from logging. And three, establish permanent funding for enhanced monitoring of both biodiversity and carbon on Massachusetts lands. <clears throat> Next. <clears throat> and so, so we're going to leave it on the, the slide that we started with for questions, right, Bill? Yes. Oh, maybe I missed a slide. OK. Here are the good. claims we made at the beginning, and we leave it up to you to decide if we've demonstrated them to your satisfaction. I believe there is now time for some questions and answers. Thank you very much for your attention. So. Okay. We're happy so to entertain arguments as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we don't have a ton of time. Hi, I'm Carol Horowitz, but um, I think we'll go over for uh, a few minutes so that we'll have more time for, for the questions. Um, so what I, um, I'm gonna take your questions in order of your hand being raised. Um, if you don't know how to electronically raise your hand, you just go to the bottom where it says reactions and you click on that and you will get a raise, you'll see the raise hand emoji. Um, so please stay muted until I call on you. And um, keep your questions, including any explanations that you want to give to no more than one minute, so we'll have time for more people to speak. Um, okay, so I see David, um, you have your hand up. You can unmute yourself. Okay. Question relating to uh, solar power development and uh, natural lands, because uh, uh, you know, I've talked over with a number of uh, people who are aiming to develop solar power, not on rooftops, but uh, on, uh, and one of them like would talk about, I'll give an example, and I don't know what, 
and then you can kind of talk to that. Somebody who has uh, fairly forested land uh, and is thinking of putting solar power in there with uh, some trimming of of the land, you know, to put the uh, the uh, ground panels in, and gets blocked by uh, state legislation and uh, or smart, uh, you know, the smart process that says uh, either you can't do that or it's quite uh, disincentivized. And what they say happens is then towns that are in there uh, don't know about that and will uh, have, have that land zone for development. Hey, David, can you get to your question? Because okay. you're running over a minute already. Okay. So what then happens is, uh, you know, this you can't put solar on there. And right. then what happens is a developer comes and cuts the whole thing down for development because the town will allow that, whereas they disintegrate solar. Uh, um, can I, uh, can we? Is that, you know, it sounds like something. David, working. David, David yeah. we're going to have to, we're going to have to um, go on um, to yeah. get an answer out of Bart or, or Bill. I'm going to just say something really quick. We, we've had exactly the opposite happen where huge areas, as a matter of fact, a quarter of all the deforestation in the state is, according to the Audubon Society, interestingly enough, is being deforested for solar panels, and it's increasing. So it's not, I, I don't see any disincentivization by the towns for this, because they're not allowed to, and that's, a, that's been an issue. So I'm going to just go on from there and to the next person. I, I don't really understand that because <laughs> there's, yeah. Okay, the next person is um, Robert. Robert, you can unmute yourself. I have two fairly uh, uh, compact questions. One, <clears throat> is it true that only 4% of the uh, wood products used in the state are logged on the state in, in Massachusetts? Is 96% of our uh, wood products coming from outside the state? Or is that because uh, land logged in Massachusetts, but rather the wood logged in Massachusetts, gets processed out of the state? Is it really true that only 4% of what we use is logged in Massachusetts? I don't yeah. have the exact figure at hand, but it's something like that. Uh, almost all the wood produced in Massachusetts leaves the state. In good measure, that's because we don't have any or very little processing facilities. Uh, and, also, and most of our wood uh, is exported to the north. Much of it goes to Canada, where there are big mills that process of it, and a lot of it ends up in China. Yes, some of it if I can just interject, some of it is is shipped directly to China as logs, and then it's processed there. Um, and so most of what what we use to build, and this has been the case for a very long time, most of what we use to build is is it comes in mostly from Canada, and it 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 doesn't have much of a relationship with what's logged here actually. And this is a very long, complicated story. I I I think we better get to some other questions, but I, I'd love to talk with you in, in more detail about that. It, it's it, so. Bert, I think you can, you can take, if you have a couple more things to say, I think right now we only have one other person with their okay. hand. Okay. Well, I'll just say, I'll questions. say that they, this has been, uh, okay. There's an issue which is, is called leakage and where there's a, 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 a claim, which is sometimes true that if you don't log one place, then it, there will be more logging someplace else to make up for it because there's a market for the wood. And while there's some truth to that, uh, government policy could incentivize, I hate that word, could encourage <laughs> um, more recycling and more use of alternative materials such as 
Oh, hempcrete and hemp wood and stuff like that. Hemp, hempcrete is supposedly even carbon negative. And then there's low carbon concrete, which is a fairly new thing, which has tremendous potential. Um, but if we use fewer wood products and the ones we used for furniture and stuff were more bamboo and more recycled wood, that would make a big difference. And the idea that we're going to grow like gangbusters again, I think, is is foolish and harmful. Um, that the 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 growth economic growth scenario for now we can get back to crazy growth again is just going to kill the environment. We are we've already done too much to it. So that's my opinion. Go on. I, so. I would just add to that that. Uh... The small fraction produced in Massachusetts isn't because there's some effort to suppress logging in Massachusetts. Quite the contrary is true. It's more market forces that account for what's going on. <clears throat> right. Can I ask I, one I, more quick question? Go ahead. What fraction of the wood logged in Massachusetts ends up just being used as fuel? Quite a lot of the wood harvested in New England ends up be, as biomass, uh, either in individual wood stoves or to produce electricity uh, in a few plants in the region. Uh, this is a really bad policy because the wood is even dirtier than coal in terms of the carbon and particulate matter it, it uh, emits into the atmosphere. And it's and, really a silly way to use our forests, which are far more valuable as bastions of biodiversity and carbon sequestration. I would. I think I think we should okay. move on now because we have a few more questions um, that we didn't have before. So, um, Lori, you're up next. Can you unmute yourself? Hi. So this is a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I have. Three quick questions. One is, um, do you see any movement from Mass Audubon and Nature Conservancy now that the system has been exposed? I can't imagine that they really intended. I mean, I'd like to think that they didn't really intend to increase carbon emissions by paying um, polluters. Um, if I can say this, um, I think they're very different. And uh, the different Audubon societies also have different policies. The one in Maine is trying to stop all this cutting for early succession habitat. They're absolutely opposed to it. They think it's very harmful and they want to instead try to increase the amount of old growth forests. That's not the case in Massachusetts at this point, but I do see some, some movement in, in Mass Audubon. The first part was that they are, they're trying to stop the deforestation that's at least resulting um, from the solar panels be uh, for a number of reasons i won't get into that but and and i see also some sort of slow movement by at least some of the officials i think there's some disagreement among some of the officials themselves about some of this uh, whereas nature conservancy servancy is pretty hardcore they partner with every single major fossil fuel company and do a great deal of effort to greenwash them and say how great they are if you go to nature if nature conservancy's uh homepage or or you know that you you will see that um whether it's shell oil or oil or you know bp or yeah all the pesticide companies, uh, without exception, all the worst polluters are are touted as being great environmentalists by Nature Conservancy. So I don't have much hope for them. Nat, uh, uh, Mass Audubon has a very different uh, uh, approach, and they seem to be able to move in different directions. They have different okay. policies. Um, and also, most of this was written in the um, Baker administration. Do you feel like the Healy administration is looking anew at it with the climate chief and the new EOEA um, staff and everything? Or... You want to say something, Bill? Um, <laughs> Melissa Hopper's wonderful, uh, and I'm sure she gets what's going on far more than any other government official I've ever encountered. 
whether the administration will really be swayed in that direction, I think remains to be seen. There are some positive signs and there's some negative signs. One of the latter being the, the making up for the billionaire ta millionaire tax by giving new tax incentives to uh, the richest among us, uh, which just yeah. it exacerbates um, economic inequality and slows our effort to make progress towards a really equitable, livable, sustainable future. Yeah. Um, and the last quick question is, I, I understand that um, I think it's Fisheries and Wildlife funds their programs through timber sales. Um, Do you see that they, changing at all? They get they get some money that way, but their their fund their funding primarily comes from the sale of guns and ammunition. Uh, because there's a federal tax on that, which is distributed to the fish and game departments, because that's what they're part of. The, what they now they now call themselves Mass Wildlife, but they're part of the fish and game department. So they get money from that, and they also get money from the sale, of course, of hunting licenses and fishing licenses. That's where their money comes from. It doesn't come from other places, um, but they do get they do get indirectly some money from from the Forest Service and, and they get grant money to pass out. Uh, they'll pay 35, in some cases I've heard of $50,000 for someone to cut an old forest to turn it into young forest habitat. And they just pay them so they mm -hmm. on private land for them to cut their forests. So they are getting some money to encourage this. And so I'm sure they get little bits around the seams, but it's not the major, a major source of their funding. So it's, it's, it's um, promoting hunting as opposed to. Yeah, you know, it's the species, they like to get young forest habitat because species like woodcock, wh whose major right. mortality factor is being shot is one of the one of the species they're very proud to be trying to increase the numbers of, and the same thing with, of course, turkeys and deer and rabbits and so forth. But you know that's not surprising. Okay, I think we should move on now because we have a yeah, few more thank questions. You. So thanks, Lori, for your questions. Um, Gia, you're next. Unmute yourself. Hi. Thank you. Thank you all who um, are have worked on this presentation. Um, I have two questions, take either or both. Um, one sh maybe is, is quick. The 40% uh, of land conserved, Massachusetts land conserved by 2050, um, what does that look like? How much of that is reserves? What is, it's, it's called conservation, not preservation, which to me means that they will be, it'll be working lands. In other words, log forest would be log. Um, my second question is, um, what can we do? What's the, what's, what's the most effective actions that, that you would recommend our, your audience take to, um, at least get our government to uh, recognize that accounting is way off and work toward accuracy on carbon accounting. Thank you. Um, if I can take that, the 40% the is all about expanding working lands. Um, it is be funded in good deal by uh, funds from the U.S. Forest Service and their forest legacy pro program to encourage private forestry um, throughout the United States, not just here in Massachusetts. Uh, there are also money in the um, Inflation Reduction Act uh, to help protect uh, rural working lands. So I, it, it, and as far as reserves go, they do not recognize reserves at all. They are not part of the program. They consider them, uh, they're about protecting the forest industry, apparently not protecting forests. Um, so I think that is a grave 
uh, omission in these plans. And there's legislation before the House and Senate now uh, that would uh, deal with that. I don't remember the number immediately offhand. There's one to ensure that uh, DFW land is uh, put in, 30% of DFW land is put into permanent reserves. Uh, I have a bill I wrote about uh, accounting uh, on carbon accounting on natural lands. Uh, that's H. Uh, 895 um, that says that we need to keep separate track of farming and working and forests and we need to keep reserves separate from working forests so they have to pay their own way so to speak and it also prevents uh, counting carbon credits sold out of, to out of state uh, um, firms as helping us reach our goal of uh, net zero. So that's one avenue. <clears throat> you might have noticed that we're going over a few minutes and, and that's intentional. We're going to take the questions that we still have outstanding. Um, I didn't, I hope I didn't cut you off, Bill. Did no. I? Okay, there was another question from Gia, which is, um, what should we be doing? And I wanted, to, you can answer that, either of you want to answer that you can but i i just wanted to say ask if anyone can i, quickly... I answered that to the extent that there okay. is legislation that would help okay that's true but um there's also um a um rally and i think can anyone speak about the october mountain rally against cutting in october mountain state forest i think it's on june 17th but i don't have the announcement it's right june in front of 17th uh, Michael Kellett and I and a couple of other people will be speaking uh, at 11 a.m. Pro protesting a major logging job to remove uh, um, ash trees infected by the emerald ash borer. Or that might be infected, become or infected. could be infected. <laughs> Likely will be, I suppose. <laughs> And that's a whole other topic. Yeah. It's... Yeah. But um, for another time, I guess. But um, okay. So, um, Lenore, you're next. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, and thank you for doing this great, anal great important analysis and somewhat overdue. Um, <clears throat> following up on something, uh, two, two things people said. One is, have you guys considered presenting this to the current administration, to Governor Healy, plus Melissa being pl present, plus plus um, this particular presentation with maybe some, you know, other people from the coalition supporting? Have you thought about that? Are you yes. going to do that? Yeah, we've thought about that. Melissa was off uh, invited this evening. She couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the recording will be available and I, we'd be happy to have a separate, any kind of arrangement to spread the word. Yeah, I think it's gotta be not just Melissa, you know. Yeah, um, well. Yeah, and, um, and uh, in, in your suggestion, and I'm glad Bill that you mentioned your legislation, I was hoping that you would. Um, and in your suggestions, I, I just wanna, uh, plant this little seed in people's minds that there's a way to have our working lands actually working for the forest and for the people. There are some incredible updated indigenous practices about food forests and agroforestry and, and growing um, food in the forest and creating lots of different kinds of ecosystems in the forest that promote biodiversity and carbon sequestration and um, resiliency and, um, and food security for sure. So uh, every time I hear the word working lands, I think let's, let's turn that around. Um, it's not just like, we don't just need wood products um, and we don't need to do business as usual. So anyway, there's a lot to learn about that that I'm just learning. Um, so just wanted to thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lenore. Lynn, you're next. Unmute yourself. 
Hi. Um, two things. Um, we are talking to Melissa Hoffer about the CECP. We have a meeting with her on um, June 5th. That is with the whole Trees as a Public Good Network. And we have a, a question already formulated about the CECP. Bart will be asking her that question at that meeting. Um, people are welcome to attend that meeting in listening mode. And um, and then my other point, my my I did have a question, and that is, is the CECP only about um, public lands, or does it include private lands as well? It, it the includes... carbon accounting they use is, includes all natural and working lands combined into one big conglomeration. Uh, they do separate it out to some degree uh, in terms of their net effects, but not both their positive and negative effect. Uh, so, And so that 27% that they claim right now is natural and working lands, that includes both private yeah. and public lands. The great bulk of that is land available for logging. And uh, is it mostly private lands? Yes, that's private. I, I'm sure they include the state forests and so on as well, but they're also up for logging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And, okay, and just for people who don't know that there there is uh, virtually no other than just a few tiny spots, there's virtually no permanently protected forests uh, permanently protected from logging. They, they can just change it every 10 years. Not that they would in every case, but it's possible. Um, the last uh, person I see with their hand up is Pam Kelly. So Pam, go ahead and unmute yourself. So this is a, a, what you just said is a major lead in to my question, which is what are the ways of permanently protecting forests? I mean, permanently. And I, I only know one, which is uh, to uh, permanently protect green burial sites, which if they are forest lands, if uh, you had forested green burials, that would be permanently protected land, supposedly. Well, I know of others, national parks. Um, you could you could create national parks. You could create a park like New York State did, and and uh, they it's much larger than Yellowstone, the Adirondack uh, Reserve, which also includes some of the Catskills, and it's protected in the Constitution as forever wild. So there's lots of ways to to do it. It's just whether there's the political clout and will to to go about doing it. I mean, lots of people have been trying for many, many years to 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 accomplish that. We may possibly, I hope, in this administration be able to do something significant like that. I'm not holding my breath, but I'm still hoping. Are there other ways of protecting permanently besides national parks, uh, constitutional protection, and green burial forests? Yes, you can pass legislation like for that New York, for example, but also Maine's Baxter and, uh, State Park and those kind of things have clear uh, limitations on logging. Um, you can also do it privately through the Wilderness Trust, but it's a very onerous process at this time. And very little land in Massachusetts has entered any kind of uh, permanent protection. There is the Northeast Wilderness Trust. You could look on their website and they do buy land, but like Bill said, most of it is not in Massachusetts, but still worth protecting. Yeah, they're a very good organization, I think. Yeah. You could give them money and they will buy private land and protect it as forever wild. You can but, find their website. 
but we do need some better some some policy changes to to really make a difference and, um, and we need some changes in in like chapter 61 having to do with um private land ownership yep. that was one of our suggestions yeah. yes they, okay. they improved that in in vermont they they now have are, are better able to keep their land uh protected from logging now which they weren't before so there's been an improvement there massachusetts seems to move a little bit more slowly and i will say although you always hear politicians patting each other on the backs about how great massachusetts is doing we are way behind in in the way we're dealing with climate and um connecticut and rhode island are ahead of us so is new york state um I just, <laughs> I just don't don't see our legislature accomplishing a whole lot the way it's set up. But that doesn't mean you're not going to try. Okay, I think we'll take one more question, and that's um, Jim Thornley, and then we're going to close after that. So, Jim, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yep, I would just say that uh, one way to do that would be to, for the people that own the, the people's land in Massachusetts, the state forests, and if we made them uh, permanently wild, the state forests that are owned by the people of Massachusetts, if we just made them permanently wild, that would be quite a bit of land right there that would be not logged. Yep, almost as much as in New York State. <laughs> But not that's quite. our goal that's our one of our <laughs> goals for sure can okay. you can you can you put in the chat the two bills that are addressing that right now so people know to support them if they don't already yeah does any, can anybody access those really quickly hmm. i'll try to while we while you close up and okay. if not we can send them to people I'm, okay I'm yeah, stopping there are... the share so so um i'm just going to close out here i just want to say there are two bills pending right now that are looking at ways to um, protect public land from logging and we're very much supporting those two bills carol will find them and put them in the chat um and we send out information janet sinclair and michael kellett send out information regularly on those two bills but we can give you some more information as well. Um, I want to thank Bill and Bart so much for all of the work that you put into this and the really good information that you provided. It's been it's been very helpful, and let's let's all give them a hand here. I thank you, thank you so so much, and thank the rest of you for attending.